The title This Mournable Body comes from an essay by Teju Cole and his essay was about the different ways in which we grieve for different bodies and his thesis is that some bodies are more grievable or more mournable than others. So now this mournable body is about a woman called Tambuzai and she is a black Zimbabwean woman. Um, distinguishable from white Zimbabwean women. And I was using that lens to show how the lives of many black women and black people on the continent of Africa are intensely mournable, although we do not mourn for them. One of the reasons might be that we don't know the circumstances in which people live and so by writing this mournable body I was able to shine a light on those kinds of circumstances that make bodies mournable. It's a completely immersive experience and it is completely immersive because Sitsi Dangarembo has done something really incredible, very difficult trick to pull off. She's written the novel entirely in the second person. She's had to manage not only writing from that point of view, but managing the narration of the instability and the disintegration of her narrator. And as a result becomes very, very complex and pleasingly difficult, but also wholly engaging. It's, it's a novel that will really pull you in. It requires the reader to become implicated in some ways. It requires the reader's collaboration, but all of that really repays the effort that it takes to read it. It's a very important, very innovative, very compelling novel. I think the prose is one of the novel's best attributes. It had a poet's sensibility, um, both in terms of compressing very difficult subject matter, an elegant concision, a kind of formal challenge to the reader as well, and, and innovation, a level of difficulty which I thought worked. Um, but it, it was on the sentence by sentence level, uh, the work of someone who is a real craftsman and understands, I think, the power of language. This Mournable Body by Sitsi Dangaremga, it's set in the, the end of the 20th century. This is a book that's really memorable. It deals with contemporary Harare, Zimbabwe, and it takes one into different worlds. It also takes one into the inner life of its central character, Tambuza, in a brilliant way. And she's a heroine who first appeared in, in the author's first novel, Nervous Conditions, back in 1988. And we see how she's approaching middle age and we, we connect with the things that she has to go through emotionally as well as societally. And it's a book that I don't think anyone will forget once they've read it. It, it, it just bowls you over. Yes, Tambo Zai really is trapped in her um, colonial past, her personal colonial past and her national colonial past. As a young girl, she grew up in a situation where white people were uh, better class citizens than black people, and she did internalize this. I think this is something that many people of color who grow up under colonial circumstances do internalize. Zimbabwe is in turmoil and has been in turmoil for a couple of decades now. And uh, the co economy has declined, mainly due to mismanagement on the part of the government, although the government would say it is due to sanctions um, by the West. So this is the environment that uh, Tambuzai is now a woman in and trying to make a life for herself and she fails to do so. So the prose in this novel is awash with this really biting, dark humour. Um, I wouldn't say it was a satirical novel, but I would say there are elements of satire that alleviate the very piercing critique that this novel is offering about the state of a nation. Um, and it works marvelously because there are times when the reader will be astonished by a very quick or witty turn of phrase. I found myself laughing out loud at moments which then caused me to reflect about whether I should be laughing out loud. And I think that was one of the masterful points that the book was making. 
I actually think that that's one of the delightful things about the novel, that the character is challenging. She is an anti-heroine in this novel, in this part of the trilogy, in a way which I think should include her in the ranks of great anti-heroines. And we shouldn't forget that, for example, Jane Eyre was an anti-heroine. Um, I had a similar feeling reading this novel as I did when I read The Bell Jar. There's that slightly surreal, slightly disorienting quality to the adventures that our narrator um, has. She is removed from the world. She is an observer. She's a loner. She's got this kind of biting way of commenting on what she's seeing. But all of that, I think, is what is incredibly attractive about the novel. If you like reading about a very very good, very interesting anti-heroine. You go on to Borrowdale Police and make your way between the BP and Total service stations. By the side of the road, you peel off your lady dies. You pull out black barter plimsolls and push the pumps into your bag. You dread the people of the fine suburb seeing you in canvas shoes, especially as you carry a much better pair hidden away. So it is a relief when you arrive at Nine Walsh Road, where Widow Riley lives, without bumping into any acquaintances. You sit down on the drain bridge by the fence to squash your feet back into your pumps. Lips are all you see to begin with, and you are terrified. Swollen feet wedged into your lady dies, you leap up. The lips are arranged in a snarl around yellow teeth. They belong to a small, shaggy-haired terrier. Yow, yow, the dog yelps, outraged at your presence. Who are you? A high-pitched voice trembles through the morning air. Ndiwe Ani, the woman repeats. She uses the singular, familiar form to address you. Since a person worth something is plural, where your value is concerned, this woman agrees with the dog.